So why do we use presentations? We use presentations because we want to hook our learners, right? We want to make sure that they are engaged. We want to make sure that they are paying attention. We want to make sure that they are focused. And that's the main reason, right? Like this one, it's bright, it's beautiful. You can see the colors are gorgeous. But some of us are just not using our presentations correctly. And sometimes, or not correctly, efficiently enough. Sometimes we're in a hurry. We just want to get it done. It just needs to be there without putting any thought into what's going on. So today we are going to be looking at three aspects and we will talk about that a little later. Um, I just wanted to say if you remember your session on the SAMR model and the TPAC way back in the beginning, building the digital lesson, some of us are only using our presentations for the substitution part. We're just um, putting up a text or the example for the learners to complete. So the example's just big on the board, but it's small in their notebooks. So we're just doing the substitution. What we really want to do is move to scaffolding and sequencing their lessons. And, and that's where your beautiful presentations are going to come in. <laughs> so today, like I said, we're going to be focusing on three things. We are going to be looking at something called the cognitive load theory, aesthetic appeal, and customization. Now, these are not things that are there to trick you or catch you out in any way, shape or form. The cognitive load theory basically states there's only so much information you can take in at a certain point. And maybe you've already reached your threshold <laughs> and now you have me talking to you. But that is what cognitive load in simple terms is about. Aesthetic value. Of course, all of us who know anything about Gen Z and these young ones, they talk about aesthetic and, oh, she's got a beautiful aesthetic because she's like all nude with her makeup and her hair is brown and all of these things. So and she just wears like natural colors. So we're going to be looking a little bit at aesthetic value of your presentations. And we're going to be focusing mostly on PowerPoint. And we will, we will look a little bit into slides, but our main purpose will be PowerPoint. And then we will see if we can import some, some beautiful templates for you later. So why did we choose PowerPoint as our point of departure? Well, we those of us who have laptops are lucky enough to have laptops, it comes with your computer. If you're lucky enough to have Office 365, you know where you get your pay slips. Um, you also have access to PowerPoint online. And we just wanted to make it as easy as possible for our teachers who are going through this process of design, of development, of creation. Such a creative process that we're going to attack today. So that's the reason why we chose PowerPoint. Now, we're not saying that there's anything wrong with Keynote or slides or any of those things. But we are thinking about you and what you have readily available. <clears throat> so I'm all sure, I'm all sure, <laughs> I'm sure all of you have heard of this picture or you have some kind of idea what this picture is all about. And if you know what this picture means, just shout it out over there um, in front of all of your colleagues, it is death by PowerPoint. We have all been in a session, I hope not like this one, where somebody is droning on and on and on and on, and there's too many things on the slide, and you are sitting there saying, what am I doing here? Why am I here today? I could have just read this. This could have been an email, right? So. If you look at this picture, you have a perfect example of death by PowerPoint. You've got an arrow for absolutely no reason, several different kinds of bullet points, a graph that makes no sense. 
You have font that you cannot read because it is too small. Fonts and colors and things all over the place. This is what we are going to try and avoid going forward. When we visit your class, when Bradley and I come in your class, and Liesl comes in your class, or Kenneth comes in your class, we want to see, oh, wow, somebody really took something away from the session on fundamental presentation design. We don't want it to be a case of the teacher standing and reading. Your subject is not like that. Right? You're not just going to stand and read from the front of the class and have the learners jot things down in their books. If you have something on the board, let it rather be vibrant. So this is just a redesigned version of Dead by PowerPoint. Same picture. But now I'm going to give you a little bit of things. Please do not do this. <laughs> now you might actually be able to read it. So you don't need 15 slides. You don't need, 15 is actually a little, actually a lot. You don't need 35 slides. It's not needed because I know when I open up a presentation and I see, oh my word, this is 60 slides, we're going to be here all day long. There's no need for that. This is a tool. You are the presenter. You are the teacher, you have the knowledge, you are going to impart it. You don't need to rely completely on the slideshow. And then your slide is full of useless information. So now you've got your word sum on the board for the learners to figure out. And you've got butterflies floating around because uh, you like butterflies and your screen is orange and it's all over the place and the poor child is so distracted. Your font makes no sense. You're using some old English font or you're using um, what's this teacher's helper, teacher's pet, which is very nice, actually. But then you use Comic Sans with it and then you use that spooky one also at the same time. And it's just too much for the learner. And again, the colors, it's just you have too many things happening on your slide. <clears throat> And you've got pictures. Like I said, the butterflies are flying around. You've got gifs of people with thumbs up. You can do this. You've got pictures that just make no sense with your content at all. And you've got for every slide that, that comes in, it goes boing, bing. That is also sensory overload for the learners. Sometimes when we think about it, we think, oh, they're going to love this. Oh, they're going to think this is so clever and cute. And oh, it's so lovely. But in reality, some of us can't deal with all of those sounds. And we have to be cognizant of the learners that are in our classroom. Some of them can't read. Some of them struggle to, to hear loud sounds. I'm sure some of you are finding my voice extremely grating right now at the end of the day. So we have to take all of those things into consideration. And lastly, the worst thing that you could ever do is read from the board while not looking at your children. And even if you're doing a presentation, say, for example, you've been shortlisted, you've got a job interview, you have to come to the um, do your presentation and it's a PowerPoint. And while you're doing it, you are reading. People can read. We are professionals. Um, you are the presentation. This is a tool, a tool that can really make or break your lesson. So these are just a little bit of please don't do this in your classroom. Try and keep it light and not too much on the screen. There's a rule of six with PowerPoint. Um, no more than six things on the screen. So here yeah, I've got a border, here yeah, I've got a title, here yeah, I've got my picture, and I've got my stuff. Okay? So sometimes we just, we think that we need to put more. Less is always more. Less is always best. <laughs> we don't need to overload our learners. I mean, look at this picture. 
What do we think of it? I, I, I'm not sure anybody's in here to have a conversation with me. Um, if we look at this picture, or oh, this is a slide, sorry. Now I understand it's all about rivers. I understand it's all about rivers. I see this blue over here. I see that this is in the color blue. I see that there is a river, but what this person has done, which is incorrect, is there's way too much text on the screen. Imagine your learner is trying to read it. It's impossible. And because of this gorgeous river, meandering river, it just looks wonderful. You just want to float down there forever. You cannot read the text. So what can we do to make it better? We can simplify the text. We can have keywords because you as the teacher, you know what you are talking about. You do not need all of this information. And even if you printed it for your learners, they would struggle to read it anyway. And then what you could do is you can just take this picture of the river and put it next to the words, just like similar to this example. OK, we're going to look at another slide now and then quickly with the person sitting next to you or just shout at the screen. Say, what do you think about this? It can be words, it can be sentences, anything. Besides that, that's me, that's my mistake. <clears throat> I, I can't hear, so I'm assuming you're all shouting at the screen. OK, so the one thing. Don't erase now. The one thing that I see on this slide is that the word. Simplification is over here. Yet the slide is anything but simple. Too many pictures. Bright colors don't make sense. I don't even know what this is about. Something about the army or the military and multitasking and being in some fourth dimension. It's just all over the place. How would you be able to even start your lesson with this? So, overload of visual stimuli. Yes, I understand we are visual learners. Completely, I get that. But there's just too much happening on this, on this page. How is my poor learner supposed to comprehend anything? And then the background, I mean, what is it? I don't even know. Can you figure it out? I don't know what it is. And I've been looking at this for like two weeks already. And it's completely inconsistent. The pictures, the text, everything, too much information. So what you could do is use a less distracting background. So even just remove the background altogether and then just simplify the visual aids and has some consistency. So it, it to me, it looks like it's the same font that's being used, right? If I look over here, uh, there's the same font, there's the, there's the same font. I'm doing a very good example of cognitive overload right now, just so you are all aware of that. <laughs> so the font is all the same, but how it's being used is not effective to what we want the learner to learn. OK, so what is cognitive overload? So I gave you a brief little definition earlier, uh, but I think I'm just going to give you a little bit more. <laughs> so basically, we have to remove the distractions and to maintain focus, and we want our learners to maintain focus and the worst thing, and I'm sure we've all ex experienced this, but I mean, if you are an incredible teacher, you've obviously never experienced this before. Someone starts drifting. Now, they could be drifting because you're reading from the board. They could be drifting because a butterfly just flew past the window, but they're drifting. And that just could be that they, at that moment, there's just too much happening. They can't focus. They are distracted, and it could be anything. <clears throat> could be sensory overload. It could be having to learn a new concept quickly and apply it quickly. And that 
really just, you know, when you're at that moment where your brain is just full, you are, I've reached my capacity. I cannot even go on anymore. This is what we're going to try and avoid as we create our slides. So cognitive overload refers to the amount of working memory that you have used. The way we consider working memory while teaching concepts and solving. The brain can only do so many things at once. So that comes directly from a psychology website. There's only so many things that we can focus on. And sometimes as teachers, I have to get through my content. My subject advisor is going to come here and say, where's the stuff in the books? Why have the learners not done this? Why are they behind with their brain quests? Why have they not done this? Where's this? Where's that? Where's this? Where's that? And sometimes us as teachers and the learners, you've reached your capacity and you just need to simplify what you have. So how can we do this? <clears throat> we use clear language. There's no need to be fancy. We just need the correct vocabulary to be used in the classroom. We use visuals that are actually working with the text. So I'm not going to have a triangle and butterflies. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm stuck on butterflies right now, ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize. And then we need to consider breaking up our work into smaller chunks. And again, I understand the situation that you are in right now, teachers, and I empathize with you and it's, it's difficult. But if we can break our work up into smaller chunks, think creatively on how to get that done. And then we use our headings and our subheadings effectively for our learners. And we use colors that complement each other and not colors that distract each other, distract you. So if we go back to this one, this one is just all over the place, right? We've all agreed too much happening over there. What we need is coherence. Things need to make sense with each other. Dinosaurs and butterflies and ice cream. I don't know. Why are they all on the screen together? We have to remove anything that is not needed. If you have your sum on the board or your equation or your shape or something that you are trying to explain to your learners, remove all the extra things. Have them engage with that thing that is in front of them. There's no need to have several different explanations of what you are going to explain yourself as the educator. I hope that makes sense. And then signaling. So when we do signaling, we basically speak about highlighting. OK, so I'm highlighting that because I want you to focus on that. Now, for those of you who are lucky enough to have Mimeos and um, E-beams, you can do this with the hide reveal feature. You can break your work down into manageable chunks for your learners. Yes, you might have a big presentation, but you're showing them or you're spotlighting certain things for them so that they're not just distracted with, oh my word, so much information all at once. And then triggering, which is an example of what I've done now. So you bring one thing onto the screen at a time. You don't put them all on at the same time. So you can have it on the board, you discuss it, and you can, excuse me, you can also remove it when you are finished discussing that. Because now with PowerPoint, which is amazing game changer, it has an entrance and an exit feature. And I think that's something that is really, really interesting that we can use and we can exploit so that we don't have our learners have this, ma'am, I don't understand. Sir, whoa, what are you talking about? Let's make it a little bit easier for them. And the way that we sequence and scaffold the work, we make sure they first understand something before they move on to the next thing. And we can do this through triggering. Okay. 
So I hope everybody's still fine right now. We are trying to optimize our learners intellectual performance. We are here, we are dedicated to our job and we are working with other people's children and we want to make sure that they are able to construct knowledge for themselves and not just reiterate what we are telling them or regurgitate, sorry, what we are saying. Okay, <clears throat> again, we are just referring back to the aesthetic value and this is about the visual and sensory qualities of design. It makes it pleasing and engaging for the learners. So we need to think about some things. Okay. And I'm an instructional designer. So when I create something, I'm an e-learning advisor and instructor. What can't you do? What we do is we break everything down. We first consider what is the theme? What is the overall idea? How are we going to get to our outcome? We work backwards. OK. So when we talk about the aesthetic value, we don't want that army picture or that river picture, that river slide. We want something simple, clean. Um, you can see that we've even embraced the um, white space. Uh, people normally used to feel you need to just fill it up with something. You can't have a white background. and um, as e-learning, we've actually embraced the white space because it's easier for somebody to look at instead of having something dark that is, uh, it can also put you in a different mood altogether, but that is a one for a different day altogether. Okay, so here we've got some tips for you to create this beautiful aesthetic that you are looking for. And you can be all fancy using the word aesthetic as you walk around to each other's classrooms and you look at each other's slideshows and you share things with your subject advisor and you say, oh, I love the aesthetic that you are going for right now. I love your contrast. I love your alignment, your proximity. I mean, uh, these are words that you, you can use to complement each other. <laughs> So what we're looking for is legibility. Again, we have to think about our learners in the classroom who can't read the italics or can't read italics that, or sorry, not italics, can't read on a yellow screen, can't read on a black screen. So we need to think about that also as we are designing. I know on Microsoft Word, it now has an accessibility checker. So it will check your work to let you know this is fine for learners with low vision. They can click on it and they'll be able to read it. And again, beautiful features that nobody knows about because we are not having these conversations. And then consistency. We want everything to be the same, basically. You can see on the screen, we have chosen the colors according to the back on track little book. You can see that we've got our headings in dark blue and we've got our numbers in red so it can stand out to you. So these are very conscious decisions that were made so that we are giving you a better product. We don't want you to sit and, and sit there for that hour and feel, do I really have to watch this? It is so unappealing. There is no aesthetic value in this at all. And then images. So there's lots of places where we can get images, where we can find images, and when we can um, use images that are not copyrighted. Some of us copyrighted, copywritten. Some of us are still going to Google images, copy, paste make it nice and big, and then you have no idea what you are even looking at at all because nothing makes sense on the page. So I'm going to show you a few places later, including PowerPoint, where you can find images, icons, stickers. I mean, it's a one-stop shop and it's on your computer associated with your Office 365 account. OK, so this is your aesthetic value. And let's just face it, we've all seen some very scary PowerPoints before that just 
you, you want to run away from the meeting because you, you just can't look at it anymore. OK. Now we are going to jump into the world of PowerPoints. And I hope that you've all heard of PowerPoint Designer. If you haven't, that's perfectly fine. We're going to go through it together. There's no need to panic. <coughs> we are going to look at this built in feature within PowerPoint that will really just help you out a lot. OK. I hope we're all ready to move on to the next section. So if you have a laptop in front of you or your desktop or something, you can follow along. If you don't want to, that's also fine. You can just watch. OK, so this is basically PowerPoint. And I am going to show you a little bit. Uh, when you open up PowerPoint, basically. Let's just get there. When you when you sign in, when you sign in, when you click on the icon to go to PowerPoint, you will you will see this for the most part. If you scroll down, you will see all of your um, work that you have already been working on. OK, this 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 all still looks fine and simple and not complicated at all. Same thing on this side. You've got your uh, printing, sharing, exporting and 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 still the same. But magic hidden feature that a lot of us are overlooking. We just click on this blank presentation and get started. No, 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 colleagues, you are going to click on more themes. And here when you are on more themes, you will see. Many different things that you could use, and it is already on your computer. You don't need to go and search anywhere else. It's right there for you built in. OK, now say you like this one. Um, it's got a little, oh, this one. Yeah, shapes. I'm going to click on the shapes. And I'm going to click on the word creates. Then it will download that theme for me and I'm able to use it. I'm able to edit it. I'm able to change it. Work through it. And there we go. Let me just see it didn't open. OK, and there it is. And the best part about this is these things, they, they, they can't move. So you can't move them out of the way, but you can work with the text. Over here, I can work in that text. Over here, I can't delete this little thing over here because it's part of the design. I click that, that's my text over there. So you've got a theme already. You've got colors. You've got the font, you've got your aesthetic already, ladies and gentlemen. There's no need for you to reinvent anything. You just have to go to File, Themes, and select your theme. And it's wonderful, easy, 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 easy. And it can also give you a guideline as to how many things should be on the slide. It can also give you a guideline as to where you should put things on your slide. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. OK, I think that is something that is quite awesome. When you think about it. Now. Remember earlier I was talking about importing, importing about pictures and where you should find your pictures. Well, the easiest place to find a picture. Say I'd like to put something over here. I want to cover this picture of this little boy. I don't really like it. Um, I don't want this picture of this little boy here. Fine, I can delete it. 
Now I'm going to insert. And I go over here. You all see it? There's media over there. I want to insert an icon. And luckily for you, ladies and gentlemen, you have access to images, icons, cut out people even. Yeah, you've got somebody who's confused. Here she is over here. She's confused. You can use that in your lesson. You've got stickers that you can put on your, on your slideshow throughout everything. Videos, illustrations, cartoon people, it's all there for you. You don't need to leave PowerPoint. There we go. So I'm going to change. Let's, let's, let's search for something. Let's search for math. And there we go. I've got a few pictures. I like this calculator. Insert. I didn't need to leave. I didn't need to go into Google and it fits directly into that shape that I deleted the little boy from. I mean, if you don't think that's cool, then I don't know. You, ne you never needed to leave PowerPoint at all. It's all there for you. There are other places that you can find um, some information. You can have a look at Shutterstock, but please do not have Shutterstock. The Shutterstock is still written on it. We've all seen that, right, colleagues? You can also have a look at FreePick for a little bit of cartoony people or flat icon if you need some extra icons. But for me, what I think is so awesome is if I click on icon again, and I need an icon because I am explaining something or whatever. Here's an abacus. Um, a clock is a tape measure, you know, so I'm going to click on it, insert it, move it wherever I want to move it to. And I can even change its color. PowerPoint tells me where to go because I've clicked on it. It tells me exactly where I need to go. I go to graphics format. And I go and find my color and I want it to be uh, this pinky color to go with that pinky color, the outline I want it to be. Below. There's my tape measure. I never needed to leave. It was all there for me. I think that's something that you can use tomorrow in your classroom if you already have a PowerPoint or if you already have a presentation that you need to do tomorrow. Then, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, I'm not sure if you can't see my screen now like that, so I'm just going to put it into slideshow. If you look at the bottom of my screen, not a lot of us, oh, wait, before we get there, sorry. <laughs> There's another way that we can um, write on our screens, and we can just click on the word draw which is also on top. We can select our little color that we want to write in. I'm going to click on purple and I'm going to say welcome. So you are able now teachers again, you don't need to leave PowerPoint to do this. It's there for you already. With a lot of things you need to leave, you have to install something else to have that kind of um, smart board experience in your class. No, no, no. Here we go. I'm clicking on my pencil. I want it to be nice and thick over there. And I'm going to write grade four math. And I don't like all of these border things, so I'm just going to remove them. I can't remove the pictures. So here I am, teacher. I'm in my class. I go to draw. 
and I'm going to use my pencil right now. So use this pencil and I want it to be black. And here I'm going to write circle. But if I wanted again to have that smart classroom experience in my class, I can go to the side over here of my ribbon. Now let's just go home so you are all fine. See this little, try this little down arrow over here. You'll click on it and you can click on the word full screen mode. Now you have this smart classroom experience in your class for your learners. And here as the teacher, you want to explain something. Let's say you'd like to insert a shape because now you're going to work on angles, I'm assuming. <laughs> I draw my shape. And now my learners are able to work with that. And you have this experience, even though you don't have a smart classroom where you don't have the software, you are still able to have a full whiteboard, input things, write on the board. If you don't have a stylus, it's fine because I know some of you now have touchscreen laptops and you can write on that laptop. And it just changes the experience in the classroom for the learners. So we spoke about cognitive load, we spoke about aesthetic, now we're talking about getting you guys to grips with PowerPoints because there's so many hidden features that we never explore. We never go into this detail because our main point is just, I gotta get through, gotta get through, gotta get through. Okay, so I am going to draw another thing over here. I'm going to select my color again and this time I'm going to go with purple. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Try. This is a rectangle, correct? That's good, Melissa. Excellent. Now, full screen. Okay. And here I'm going to write rectangle. And your learners can do this. Give them that experience, give them that exposure. This is just something that from the previous session, we thought this is something that we could just share with you um, because it's just a hidden feature that no one talks about. <laughs> OK, so I'll get out of that one right now and I want to see my ribbon. <laughs> OK, and obviously to make this bigger and smaller, you can just drag it around or if you want to pull up your notes, you can just pull it up over there. So you won't break anything. Don't, don't be worried about that. You're not going to break anything. OK. Now, one of the other fun features that we have in PowerPoint is designer. So designer is something that a lot of you, I'm sure when it pops up, you just say, oh, no, I don't need this right now. But this is a magical, a magical world. <laughs> If you click on it, it will generate new ideas for you. So yeah, I've got my normal circle and my words. Designer has decided by itself. Let's see if I can zoom in for you. Yeah. Zooming the wrong thing. Doesn't want to zoom. OK, so you can see here I have different options. So I took my circle and now it has made it squares. Now, morph is a transition. And I know earlier I spoke about animations. So when we talk about animations, I mean these things, you know? Um, everything is growing and turning and zooming and swiveling and bouncing, you know? That is a little bit, let me just show you, but I'm sure you've all seen it before. That bouncing thing. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes uh, the learner might find it a bit much. 
<laughs> There's also an option for you to put a sound with it. Why am I telling you this? Please do not put a sound with it. OK, so now we're going to work on morph. This is a wonderful transition. It can make your presentation look as though you have magical powers and you can do all of these fantastic things. But actually, it's just PowerPoint. OK, so I'm just going to see if I can delete all of these things quickly. I've got circle. Yeah, that should be enough. So now you you know the, the, the different transitions that we have. Dissolve, the curtain, the checkerboard, all of those things. Fracture. Oof, oof, oof. OK. Now we're going to go to morph. I've selected morph for my transition and I'm going to click on apply to all. But you have this part over here, effect options. You can either move objects, words or characters. So we are going to start with characters. So that is individual letters. That's the individual letters. Here we go in slideshow. agenda. No, it doesn't want to. There we go. So you can see from the one slide to the other slide, the letters that are in the next slide moved to the next one. How cool is Morph, guys? Teachers, sorry. How I love Morph. I think it brings a different feel to our work. And again, your learners, your colleagues will think, wow, wow, wow. You have been studying PowerPoint left, right and center. Look at what you can do. The next part. Is words now we didn't have many words, so let's start with this one. And let's say words will apply to all. And I'm going to start from this slide current. And let's see how many words flow to the next slide. Obviously not confidence. Not that one. So just the word your moved, OK? And then the last example to show you with morph. <clears throat> I do hope it will work. Transition, morph. Objects. OK, let's see from here. If it's going to work, let's start with this one. OK. Click on slideshow, current slide. Not working with the objects, which is fine. But it worked with the words. Look at that. I think this is just interesting and I think it's 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 something that you can use, you can exploit, you can. Just make your work a little bit interesting for yourself and also for your learners. Fantastic. OK, so final tips and takeaways. That's where we are right now. <laughs> I hope that you have gained at least one thing from this session. We have gone over the cognitive load and how we need to just be aware of that. And there are certain things that we can do to make it a little bit easier for our learners in the classroom. And then we also have spoken about aesthetic appeal and how you can find templates directly on 
PowerPoint itself. We also spoke about some annotation tools that you can use. Uh, there's one directly on PowerPoint itself. It's the draw tool, and I think it's you can exploit that one as well and pretend as though you've got all this fancy technology in your class. And then transition with Morph and the designer tool.